Amen. Well, two monetary amounts have become very significant for myself. One is $6.79, and the other is $6.99. You say, well, why is this so significant? Well, next Sunday, May 31st, is my 55th birthday, and I qualify for the senior discount at Denny's. For $6.79, I can get the French Toast Slam or the Belgian Waffle Slam. And for $6.99, I'm entitled to scrambled eggs and the cheddar breakfast right there. I hope that you'll be praying for us. Elaine and I do take off next Friday. We'll be preaching Friday night, Saturday, and then Sunday. And I already told Chris Broom, bro, 6 o'clock, you and me and his son Austin, we're going to Denny's. And I'm getting the senior discount. Amen? And so, I've just entitled the lesson today, Old Guys Rule. <laughs> Old Guys Rule. I want us to look in the book of Ecclesiastes, and we're going to look at the worldly view from Solomon of aging. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12. He starts off with the great admonition. And then he goes through what it's like to age. In verse 1, he admonishes the reader. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Can I have an amen on that one? Before the days of trouble come. That's old age. And the years approach when you'll say, I find no pleasure in them. That's the world as you get older. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain. You know, when you're young, everything is bright and hopeful. But in the world as you age, it's one storm after another storm after another storm. When the keepers of the house tremble, that's your arms. You got Parkinson's, they shake. And the strong men stoop. You get hunched over. When the grinders cease because they are few, your teeth fall out. And those looking through the window grow dim. Your eyes can't see so well. When the doors of the street are closed, you don't want to go out. Sometimes you can't go out. And the sound of grinding faints. When men rise up, the sound of birds, but all their songs grow faint. Well, three illusions right here. As you age, sleeping becomes more and more difficult. And so the very slight sound of birds wakes you up. Secondly, it says, but all their sound, songs grow faint. There's, there's no joy. Joy just becomes faint in the distant past. And of course, your hearing goes. It comes a little faint. When men are afraid of heights and of the dangers in the streets, you lose courage and daring. When the almond tree blossoms, well, almond trees are white when they blossom. Get white hair, sometimes no hair. <laughs> and the grasshopper drags himself along and the desire no longer is stirred. He's talking about losing your desire for sex right there. <laughs> then the man goes to the eternal home and his mourners go about in the street. That's the worldly view of aging. But we understand in the kingdom of God, old guys rule. Let's go. We're going to look at three old guys today. The first one is in Genesis chapter 5, Enoch. We're going to learn from Enoch that a relationship with God should never die. In Genesis 5, verse 21. When Enoch had lived 65 years... He became the father of Methuselah. And after he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived 365 years. Enoch walked with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he became the father of Lamech. And after he became the father of Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Methuselah lived 969 years 
and then he died. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he had a son. He named him Noah, and he said, He will comfort us in labor and in painful toil of our hands caused by the ground the Lord had cursed. Right here we find the man Enoch, who lived 365 years. Now that's pretty cranky, huh? But you know, he had a son named Methuselah. Totally outdid the dad. Methuselah lived 969 years. And if you do the math, you see, Methuselah became the father of Lamech when he was 187. Lamech became the father of Noah when he was 182. And the flood came when Noah was 600 years old. You add that all up, and you'll find out that Methuselah died in the flood. He was an unrighteous man. You see, old age only guarantees one thing. You're going to die. You're going to die. And for Methuselah, it was an empty death. But you know, Enoch was special. The Bible says that he was 65 when he had his first kid. And he was so moved at the birth of his child that he began to walk with God. You know, I've been blessed to see all three of my children born. And if you've not had that opportunity, it, it is one of the most breathtaking away experiences. Out of the horrific pain that the woman has comes this little life. <laughs> Amen, sister. It's a little bitterness right there. A little bitterness. But you see, Enoch didn't have any bitterness. He saw this little life in his hand and he said, there is a God. Life is not by accident. It is from God. And from that day forward, the Bible says that he walked with God. Now, I've been a Christian 37 years, but I pale compared to Enoch. He walked with God 300 years. And he was a pretty special man because he was one of only two men that did not die. The first, of course, was Elijah, who was taken up by a chariot of fire into the heavens. And the other was Enoch. He walked with God 300 years, and the Bible says, and then he was no more. He was with the Lord. You say, well, how about Jesus? Well, Jesus died. Only Elijah and Enoch did not die. You know, I'm asked the question, how do you stay faithful for 37 years? Of course, could you imagine being Enoch? How do you stay faithful for 257 years? Well, there's a challenging scripture we find in the Song of Songs. It simply says in verse 15, chapter 2, Catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. For those that are visiting, recently Elena and I had the chance to be over in London, England and to be with the church there. And they send their greetings. Uh, the Lord is really working. They had their sixth baptism in six weeks today. Is that awesome? And God is moving powerfully in that remnant group. But while we were there, on the last day, we saw three little foxes, cute little red foxes running by the roadside. And I said, man, look at the foxes. And Tim goes, oh, bro, they're all over everywhere. And so when I, when I got home, I wanted to read about the foxes that were in London. So I, I got an article. This is, believe it or not, the Bloomberg Report. At nightfall in London, 
Phil Overton places a bowl of cat food in the middle of Wimbledon tennis court, moves to the stands with a 22 caliber rifle, and waits. To lure his prey, the 43-year-old pest controller makes a sucking noise on the back of his hand that sounds like a frightened rabbit. Then he pulls the trigger and watches another furry creature drop dead on the hallowed tennis grounds. Overton is fighting a losing battle against a tenacious invader, foxes. He is one of a handful of specialists called in as a last resort and kills about 100 foxes a year from the city's growing population of 10,000 foxes. London is the world's fox capital, <laughs> according to the conservation group Wildlife Trust. During the past decade, foxes have taken up homes in Downing Street, City Hall, the Millennium Dome, and St. Paul's Cathedral, as well as Parliament and Buckingham Palace. Foxes are complete and utter hooligans and do an awful lot of damage, says Bruce Lindsay Smith. Attracted by discarded takeout food and garbage, foxes dig up gardens and keep residents away with a mating call known as the vixen scream. Some even go inside houses to spread fleas and ticks, says Lindsay Smith. Michael Sidwell, 57, a business consultant, and his wife Susan, 45, a housewife, hardly go into their garden in the suburban South Norwood anymore. One morning they looked out and saw five foxes. They spent almost $1,900 on deterrence, including chicken wire, spikes, and sonar gadgets. But to no avail. Our life is being made a misery, said Susan. The first time I heard the mating call, I thought it was a baby being murdered. We can't sleep, and the smell is absolutely horrible. See, we look at these little red foxes as cute little things. Over in London, Susan says, our life is a misery. And that's exactly what the writer is saying here in the Song of Songs. The little foxes come on in and destroy the garden. They destroy the vineyard. The vineyard being your life and your fruitfulness. What are the little foxes that can destroy our vineyard? They're the little foxes of excess, inconsistency, and neglect. Our excess, even as disciples, begins to destroy our vineyard and our fruitfulness. There's overeating, oversleeping, overwithdrawing your bank account, over the speed limit. You know, God gets out at 65 on the interstate. Over the time limit in the parking spaces, producing one ticket, two ticket, 12 tickets, and financial doom. Overindulgence in computers, MP3s, and texting. This gives in to inconsistency in Bible study, and prayer, and discipleship partner times. Some people don't even have a set time for discipleship partners, and they wonder why they're struggling. Neglect. We neglect memorizing scriptures. We neglect prayer with our mate. We neglect prayer with our households. We neglect family devotionals. We even neglect fasting. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, when you pray, and in that same chapter, he says, and when you fast. It's not a matter of if you're going to pray, it's not a matter of if you're going to fast. You fast when you have a major decision to make in your life. And yet people are wondering, why am I not happy? Why am I miserable as a disciple? The little foxes have come on in and begun to destroy the vineyards. Let's look at the book of wisdom and see what this fox is called. Turn to the book of Proverbs. Beginning in chapter 10. Come on, Jeff. In verse 26. As vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to those who send him. What is, what is that little fox that destroys us? Laziness. A lazy person cannot 
be counted on. Turn to 13, verse 4. The sluggard craves and gets nothing, but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. You know, there are a lot of disciples who are miserable, who have a dream to do this or that in the kingdom, and yet their lives amount to nothing because they're a sluggard and they're lazy. Chapter 24, verse 34. I went past the field of the sluggard, past the vineyard of the man who lacks judgment. Thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds, and the stone wall was in ruins. I applied my heart to what I observed, and I learned a lesson from what I saw. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come on you like a bandit, and scarcity like an armed man. The field, the vineyard of the sluggard, it's fruitless. It's filled with thorns and the cares and the worries of this life, to quote Jesus. The sluggard loves sleep, but he says, oh, just a little sleep after the alarm clock goes off. A little sleep, a little folding of the hands. And poverty will come on you like a bandit. Chapter 26, verse 13. The sluggard says, there's a lion in the road, a fierce lion the streets. He's always making excuses. As the door turns on its hinges, so a slugger turns on his bed. See that go. go. I'm going to turn the other side. We're going to get a little bit more. The slugger buries his hand in the dish. He's too lazy to bring it back to his mouth. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who answer discreetly. It is amazing to me that the fruitless people Got all the complaints in the church. Guys, we, we need to understand. These little foxes of excess, inconsistency, and neglect will destroy your life. Will destroy your vineyard. You see, Enoch was an old guy that always walked with God because he knew that was where true life was really at. You know, I was talking to Lou Jack this week and he says, you know, bro, when I drifted away from God, when discipling was done away with in the churches, I at first was happy. Oh, now I can stay home and watch TV. And, and you know, after a while, it just got boring. Now, if, if I don't have my schedule <coughs> full with with people to study with and get with and encouraging disciples, my life feels so empty. It's so great to have my purpose back. You see, when you lose your purpose, when you lose your walk with God, it's a slow fade because those little foxes are eating away at your very heart for God. Our second old guy, it's Caleb. What do we learn from him? The dream never dies. Joshua chapter 14. The setting right here is that the promised land has essentially been conquered. And Joshua is about to do the allotments for each one of the tribes and for specific families amongst the Hebrew people. Beginning in verse 6 of chapter 14. Now the men of Judah approached Joshua Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephna, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my brothers who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever, because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, 
He has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses while Israel moved in about the desert. So here I am today, 85 years old. I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out in a battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified, but the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephthah, and gave him Hebron as an inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephthah, the Kenite, ever since, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. Hebron used to be called Kiriath Arba, after Arba, who is the greatest man among the Anakites. You know, right here is a powerful scene. It's two old guys. It's Joshua. Now we know that they've pretty much conquered the promised land. And we know from the book of Joshua that Joshua dies at 110 years old right after he gives out the inheritance to Jews. So right now we see a 109-year-old guy, that's Joshua, talking to an 85-year-old guy, that's Caleb. Old guys rule. Amen, guys? And Caleb says, Joshua, I want my inheritance just like Moses, the man of God. And we got to remember he's a man of God and he never lies. Just like Moses, the man of God, promised me, and perhaps we don't quite get it right here. He said, in verse 9, so on that day Moses swore, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance. He's very specific there. And he asked for a very specific part of the inheritance of Judah. Now, the specific part he asked for in the international version is the hill country. And this is a powerful thing because we understand that the hill country represents a tougher area to conquer. But there was something more to this than just it being the hill country and tougher to conquer. The clue's given away a little bit later. The Bible says that they gave the name Hebron to that place, but it was originally called Kiriath Arba. If you go back into the scriptures in the book of Genesis in chapter 23, you will find that is where Sarah was first buried. And Abraham was buried beside Sarah. And later on, Isaac and Rebekah are buried there. And later on, Jacob and Leah are buried there. You see, when they spied out the land, they made sure that they went to the sacred ground of the patriarchs, the patriarchs of the Hebrew people. And Caleb remembered that. He says, that sacred ground is now occupied by the uncircumcised. And I am going to take them out of there. The Lord help me. He says, I am just as vigorous today as when I first went on in there at 40 years old. And I'm 85 years old today. That's what he said. It's kind of like May when she says, I have the face of a 19-year-old. I wish I could say that. Amen. <laughs> but I mean, the Bible says right here that this was his heart. 85 years old. And just as vigorous as when he was a young guy. 40, that he had the same faith when he went to the people of God in the minority and he said, this land, this land of milk and honey, we can take because God is with us. But the majority, the 10, said, no, no, we can't do it. It's impossible. Impossible. How often we listen to the majority of the faithless instead of the minority of faith. And right here, Caleb once more says in the King James Version, give me this mountain. Give me this mountain. And of course, the whole idea there is that is the greatest challenge. In 1986, there was an article that came out in the Wall Street Journal entitled, 
the Mount Everest of mission work, Japan. It was a very curious article because earlier that year, we had a former missionary move to our congregation in Boston. His name was George Gurganis. And George, as a young man with his wife, Irene, after World War II, had gone over to Japan to really demonstrate the love of God, to go over to our very enemies and preach Christ. They built the church building with their hands. They built a little missionary house with their hands. And they stayed there 10 years preaching the word. Situations came, and so George and Irene came back to the States, where George got his Ph.D. and became very famous in founding uh, mission works, uh, training centers of missionaries in Harding College and Abilene Christian University. But when he turned 65, he had to leave. He had to retire. That was the law of Abilene Christian University. And so he retired out in Missouri. And I, and I heard about it. And I said, George, I want you to come and visit us here in Boston. I want you to come and see what you've been preaching about. So he came. He spent three days. And he says, this is what I've dreamed about all of my life. A church that is loving. A church that's full of fire. A church whose mission is to evangelize the world. I said, well, George, you know, Christians don't retire. Christians just retread. Amen? I said, how about you move here? He says, well, I really want to, but I got to ask Irene. <laughs> Irene came out that Wednesday. She just cried the entire time. She was at the midweek. She made the decision that night, and George and Irene moved shortly afterwards. And they came to be a part of the church, and they were such and inspiration, being missionaries of long ago. But after being there for about a year, George came to me. He says, bro, I can't, I can't stay here in Boston any longer. The Spirit is calling me back to Japan. And so at 70 years old, George and Irene go back as missionaries to Tokyo, Japan. And we took that little mainline Church of Christ congregation, the Yogahachiman Church. We called out a remnant, and it became the Tokyo Church of Christ that grew to over a thousand disciples. The largest church of any kind in all of Japan. Is that awesome? George labored there in that very difficult mission field on just a few more months until his death, where 3,000 people came to pay homage to a man whose faith had called us higher. You know, I'm also blessed to be able to have a brother like, like John Bashai. Uh, John is going to be 80 on Halloween Day in October. And that's interesting because that's the same exact birthday as Irene Gurganis had. And uh, I, I love John. John is, is always one that's been full of zeal. And it's so awesome to see him come all the way from Nashville to come and visit us. Here, just a little bit before 80 years old. And yet he's very humbled by where he stands spiritually. He says, I've drifted away. He says, and this is his terminology. He says, I haven't caught any fish for four years. He says, I'm tired of it. He says, I can't find any disciples there. He's moving here in June. Amen, guys? <clears throat> See, he, he's a man that wants to walk with God again. And it takes a lot of courage to say, listen, I've, I've not been walking with the Lord, but I want to walk with the Lord again. I mean, John was the one that, that got us into Egypt, the one that got us the church building that we met in. He was the one several times that I was going to be blocked when I went on into Egypt to preach. He had friends in Egypt, a senator 
in Egypt that would come and greet me at the airport and just take me through security. That's the way to go, amen? (laughs) And when my wife and my children were there for a summer preaching the word, John made sure that we were safe and taken care of. You know, it was fun being with John when he first flew in on, on Friday. He says, bro, can you take me down to Redondo Beach? He said, I used to have my law practice there, and that's where I reached out to all the fishes. <laughs> and so he took me on out, and he, he wouldn't let me buy the coffee, but we had a little, little, little bit of espresso. And, and then I, I kind of sensed that he wanted to go out to the beach. So we, we went on, and we sat by the beach there in Redondo. He says, you know... I've seen many fishes baptized here. He says, I want to see more fishes baptized here. And we prayed that that would be what God would do. And it's so inspiring when you see someone that's 80 years old who still has the dream. Because we see so many people, like Ecclesiastes 12, that are empty and heartless, and bored, and their lives have absolutely no significance. Yes, for Caleb, the dream never died. As a matter of fact, he just said, give me the mountain. Give me the tough part. Let the younger guys deal with the easy stuff. (laughs) Our last old guy is the Apostle John himself. And from him we learn that love cannot die. Let's go to the book of 1 John. In 1 John chapter 4, we find an extraordinary passage because when John was a young disciple, campus age, He was nicknamed by Jesus as one of the sons of thunder. He would see people that didn't want to respond to Jesus. He says, Lord, can I call down fire from heaven to zap them? Come on, Victor. (laughs) And yet, in his later days, inspired by the Spirit of God and changed through the trials of life, he writes this passage beginning in verse 16. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we'll have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we're like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love Because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a flat liar. For anyone who doesn't love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And he's given us this command. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. You know... Tradition holds it that all the apostles died a martyr's death, except John. Now, they tried to kill him. Tradition holds it that they put him in a boiling vat of oil, but he was unscathed. So they they banished him to the Isle of Patmos, where, of course, the Spirit of Jesus gave him the book of Revelation. And he lived to an old age, tradition says, to about 90. And a lot of the brothers and sisters thought as he aged, he was getting senile. So why? Well, whenever there was a problem in the church and the disciples would come to him, he'd he'd say the same thing. He'd say, love one another. When brothers had a monetary problem between them, he'd say, love one another. When there's a problem in their Bible talk, love one another. When there were marriage problems and someone was thinking about even getting divorced, he'd say, love 
one another. See, he always gave the same advice. No longer was it rain fire down from heaven, but love one another. You know, I, I am one of the most blessed men. I get to lead the West region of the City of Angels Church. Amen? And over the past couple of months, it's been amazing. I, I just show up for Wednesday night, and our region has doubled in size. Holy Spirit's brought people in through baptism, through restoration, through placing membership. I mean, it's, it's awesome. It's God. And you remember we talked about last week that it's God that gives the increase. Well, who are the hard workers? Well, we got Vic Jr., we got Ken Zindler, and we got Nick Portieri. I mean, and all the other brothers and sisters. And the sisters, amen. <laughs> and the, the people were great, but we'd, we'd really flatlined. And one of the things that I saw is that we just didn't have a loving group. And so for the past several weeks, Elaine and I have just been in there calling people to love one another. See, I don't think the apostle John really was senile. He just got smart and full of wisdom of God. You want to have a growing region? Love one another. You want to have a growing Bible talk? Love one another. You want to be fruitful? Love one another. When people see Sold out disciples that really love each other. The Holy Spirit's going to bring non-Christians from everywhere. The remnant is going to travel all the way from Nashville, Tennessee. Because people desperately want the love of God in their lives. People desperately want to be in a group that, that loves them for who they are. Even, even knowing all the sins and shortcomings. I mean, in, in the West region, it's, it's, it's been crazy. It's been fun. We've had steak dinners. That produces a lot of love with brothers. <laughs> I mean, we were feeling the love of God that night. I washed the, all the brothers' feet. That produces love. This past week, I gave a lesson on anger. Because two of the, the most challenging sin for men is lust and anger. We did lust the, the, the time before. And it was really great. I, I talked about how if we're really going to build a great region here in the West, we have got to cultivate a safe place where people can get open with their lives. And you see, when, when people can get open with their lives, then there's not going to be secret sin. See, it's not a matter of if we're going to sin as disciples. It's when we're going to sin. And if you have a group of people whose primary focus is only zeal and being strong, well, then you don't want to come and say, oh, man, I really messed up this week. You have a church. You have a church that's full of love. Say, how much love? Well, a church where every member is willing to die for Jesus Christ and die for each other. That's how much love. You have a church like this where it is a safe place and you can get open with your life and be vulnerable. Wow. Because you can't really love until you bring everything into the light. But once you brought everything in the light and the brothers are still hugging you, you go, wow, I love this church. This is awesome. This is where I want to be. So that's what we got to have in every region, in every city, in every nation. You know, last night we had the going away party for Javier Ochoa. And uh, I've never seen the Velasco's house any fuller. I, I bet there were 60, 70 people inside that, that, that house just crammed in there. Because they wanted to honor this young man that is being sent to be an intern in Santiago, Chile. He leaves tomorrow, amen? 
And uh, it's great because the, the churches, the baby churches in New York and Washington, D.C. are supporting him. Is that awesome? And, I mean, it was, it was, it was powerful, the, the sharing by the brothers and sisters. But it was a, a night I'll never forget because Javier desperately wanted his father to come to one of the church events. And so he begged his father to cook carnitas for everybody. So in the back of Sal's house, they get this fire going, this big vat. They dump some lard on in there, put the pork fats on in there. And they're grinding. They, they literally have this giant stick to put all the things, churning it and everything. It's all melting on down. And then all the Latin brothers are eating all the, the fats and stuff like this. <laughs> and... And then they dump in all the pork meat. And he's just churning it like this. I mean, it was incredible. <laughs> Tasted even better. <laughs> but what was awesome was that the last part of the sharing, Javier shared. And as he shared, his father just broke down crying. And Javier broke down crying. You say, why? We'll turn to Mark chapter 10. In Mark 10, of course, is the account of the rich young ruler. Jesus looked at him and loved him, and he says, you lack one thing. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And of course, the man went away sad. And then all the apostles started to doubt well, then who then can be saved? And Jesus says in verse 27, Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Amen, church? Amen. Peter said to him, Well, we've left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied. No one who's left home or brothers or sisters or mother, father, children, or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and with them, persecution. And age to come, eternal life. Wow. Right here, Peter says to Jesus, Lord, we've left everything. And Jesus says, well, then the promise is yours. He says, no one who's left home, brothers, sisters, mother, father, children, or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times that in return. With a persecution. It's in, it's in parentheses in my Bible, but amen. But a hundred times that. Not just in heaven, but now amen. is the promise. You know, I told Javier... When I first asked him to go to Santiago, I said, bro, we need you to go. His first thing is, well, I don't want to leave my dad. I says, isn't it interesting, brother, that your dad still hasn't become a Christian, though you've shared with your faith with him many times. Maybe what your dad needs to see is that as much as you love him, you love God and the gospel more. And you could see last night the anguish not just inside of Javier's dad, but the anguish inside of Javier. Not that there was doubt, but he knew he was paying the price of everything. And then Victor Gonzalez Sr. simply shared with the whole group, your dad's promise to come to church today. You know, a lot of us want to see our moms and dads, brothers and sisters, sons, daughters, friends become Christians. And in our sentimentality, we don't want to take a stand. For fear it will drive them away. Others of us, we want to collect the remnant to be part of a movement of God. But we don't want to hurt any of our relationships. And so we refuse to take a stand for the convictions that it takes a movement to evangelize the world in a generation. In our fear of losing relationships. You know, I'm so appreciative 
of Sasha Kostinko. I shared about Sasha last week. The brother that led all the former Soviet Union, 11,500 disciples. And then there came a time where he was pushed out of leadership and disdained. Well, you know, excitingly, I've I've talked to Sasha three times this week. He says, I'm preaching this Sunday, Kip. I'm nervous, but I'm preaching, and I'm so fired up. I have met so many of the brothers and sisters that were baptized back in 1991 this week. It's freaky. I haven't seen these people for 10, 15 years, and then this week they're coming, and so many people are coming, come out, because I'm preaching the word again. See, Sasha's made a tough decision. Joining the movement is going to cost him relationships. But just like the heart of Caleb, it's all about convictions. We love God and we love one another out of our conviction that Jesus is Lord. And so we must love one another. You want to be effective? Love one another. At all costs, love one another. You know, at the end of the sharing by Javier, I, was, I was, wasn't expecting it because I'm not really that close to Javier. The brothers that have ministered most have been Lou Jack and Raul and Vic Sr. and Vic Jr. And I really haven't spent much time with him. But he just turned to me and, 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 and he said something that, that just really moved me. I got choked up. He says, brother, thank you for not giving up on the dream. And you know, there were days that I wrestled with it. But you know, I'm heading for 55 in a week. I'm heading for that senior discount. (laughs) And you know, as you get older... You're either going to fade into oblivion like all the old guys in the world. Or you're going to walk in the footsteps of Enoch, of Caleb, and the Apostle John. From Enoch, we learn, do anything. Don't let laziness destroy your life. From Caleb, we learn to go anywhere. Give me that mountain. And from John, we learn to give up everything. That is a disciple of Jesus Christ. Thank you. God bless.